The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well being of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Badera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, we have a returning guest with us today, don't we? We are delighted to welcome back Randy Curtis, who is professor of medicine at the University of Washington, where he's also director of the Cambia Palliative Care Center of Excellence. Welcome back to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Randy. Thanks so much. It's great to be back. Uh, Randy, we got a lot to cover today. But before we get into the topic at hand, you got a song request for Alex. I do. The song is Good Life by One Direction. All right. So this one has a little bit of whistling, which I enjoy. A little bit of syncopation, which I find a fun challenge. So we'll see what happens. (laughs) Woke up in London yesterday Found myself in the city near Piccadilly Don't really know how I got here Got some pictures on my phone New names and numbers that I don't know Address the places like Abbey Road Day turns to night, night turns to whatever we want We're young enough to say, oh This has gotta be a good life This has gotta be a good life This could really be a good life A good life, say, oh That feeling that you can't find This city is on fire tonight This could really be a good life, a good, good life. Randy, um, can we ask, why'd you pick that song? Yeah, well, as you both know, I was diagnosed with ALS this past March. And this song, well, the diagnosis has given me an opportunity to really reflect on my life and what a great life it's been and and how I want to live that life going forward. This song captures some of that for me. When I think about, you know, the people who have made some of the biggest contributions to our field in palliative care, uh, not just from a, like studies and publications, but the, the sheer amount of people that you've mentored <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, uh, and continue to do so, um, like just hearing that song also makes me want to cry. Um, mm-hmm. Just because you've been such an important part of everything that we do. Um, so first, thank you for all of that. Well, thank you. Um I really appreciate that. It's, <clears throat> you know, this brings up a lot of questions and issues for me around my legacy. And as you said, I think mentoring has been something that's been very, very important to me. And probably the thing about which I'm most proud. Mm-hmm. I should also warn you that if I become emotional, I will become mute. That's one of the special gifts of ALS is that I can't tear up and continue to speak. So if that happens, you guys may be on your own for a little while. Okay. Well, um, you know, uh, if it's okay with you, because again, you have done so much for the field and you're you're one of the, like when I think about the, the experts in in palliative care, um, both in building kind of our knowledge base and our expertise and from a clinical perspective too. I wonder, since you've been through this process from the diagnosis to where you are now, is there anything that kind of surprised you from being on the other side, being not just the the palliative care, the critical care doctor, um, but the, the patient? I'm not sure I would say this surprised me, but one thing it has really reaffirmed for me is that uh, what I care most about for my providers is that they care about me as a person. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And, you know, I mean, that's something we've been teaching in palliative care for 30 years. I can't say it's a surprise, but it is a surprise to me how powerful it is. Yeah. And has it changed any part of your perspective on, you know, how we should be caring for patients with serious illness? Or, again, what our role is in palliative care for people with serious illness like ALS? Yeah. Um, you know, I come to this with a lot of resources and contacts and people I know. And yet, even so, even with the connections I have, having that extra layer of support, as we love to say, is so important. It's been so important for my wife and I. Yeah. Are you seeing palliative care, Randy? I I have uh, set up uh, my first visit with palliative care. Mm -hmm. So we haven't, I haven't seen, I haven't formally seen palliative care yet, but I'd say about... <laughs> 40% of my friends are palliative care <laughs> providers, so <laughs> yes and no. And so you were diagnosed in March, right? Yes. And um, I have the opportunity to talk with a lot of people from a lot of different places. And I've noticed that you're still mentoring a lot of them and, and doing a lot of stuff from a professional standpoint. I wonder when you when you think about kind of this diagnosis, has it changed at all how you think about kind of your academic priorities? Um, Absolutely. And, yeah? Absolutely. I, uh, what this diagnosis has done for me is what I wish I had done 10 years ago, which is really a focus in on what is most important and let a lot of other things go to the side. What's most important to me is focusing on the people I'm mentoring, setting up the center that I direct for the future with a leadership transition plan, and really focusing on, on those things. So, you know, I, I have begun to feel like one of my mantras now is to live every day like you have a terminal illness. Um, and what I mean by that is really being able to think about what's most important and and focus on that and not to get distracted by all the other distractions that come up. Mm -hmm. Are there projects that you're currently working on that, that you're really excited about or want to make sure that it comes to fruition or um, see where it goes? Yeah, it is really two main interventions that I've been focusing on in the last five years. One is a jumpstart intervention to try to promote goals of care discussions. And we have a, a randomized trial, actually an R1 that funds two randomized trials of the jumpstart in the acute care setting. Um, and then we're really developing a program of research um, to look at this in different settings and to try to make it much more scalable than the original intervention that we published. That original intervention was very successful. I'm very proud of it. We elevated goals of care discussions from 31% in the control group to 74% in the intervention arm. I actually talked about that on my last year, pal. Mm -hmm. podcast, but um, it requires surveying patients to create the jumpstart, and it's just not very scalable. Um, and so now we're trying to do that where we generate a jumpstart from information in the EHR so we don't have to survey people. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. And it, it, <laughs> so many different ways I feel like we can kind of take this conversation. And I'm, I'm wondering kind of if it's possible to kind of go back to thinking about, I think part of what has made you such an incredible resource to the field 
has been the, the mentorship that you've provided and that you continue to provide. And then when you even think about kind of jumpstart and all these interventions, thinking about kind of next steps, I wonder if there's, if we can go back to kind of advice for current, um, for the people listening on this phone call, do you have any like overarching themes of what makes a good mentor of what's worked for you? Um, Cause I gotta say, um, you're you're pretty exceptional in that regard, pretty much to everybody that I've talked to. Thank you. I I have been thinking about this, and um, <clears throat> I think perhaps for me, one of the most important pieces of advice for mentors is is something we can use our draw on our pelvic care skills for, which is really listening. As a mentor, one of the most important skills, I believe, is being able to listen to the person you're mentoring. Help them understand their values and goals, if you will. Mm -hmm. Help them articulate them and listen to what they are and figure out how to support that. Mm -hmm. um, I think I am a firm believer in mentoring being a two-way street, mm -hmm. that mentors have to get something out of it as well as mentees, and that's an important thing for mentees to realize. Mm -hmm. But as a mentor, even though it is a two-way street, I, I really believe that the really good mentors understand it's not about us. Mm -hmm. It's not about what's good for us or what we did. It's about who this person is in front of us and how do we help them do what, the, what really will make them happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways it sounds like you're describing like a great family meeting. Like <laughs> you start yeah. off listening to them about how things are going. And then we we move on from like illness understanding to goals. Like, what's important to you? What are you worried about as like a junior faculty member? What are you hoping for? Exactly. Before we even get into fix it mode, which is what are the things that I can help with right now? And it's funny how like we we know all of these skills work in palliative care, but oftentimes we don't use it in other portions of our life. Yeah. Like you could probably talk to my wife. Like I have a emotional IQ of a rock at home, <laughs> but um, <laughs> like I try to build those skills up. Like when I'm seeing patients. Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> that's absolutely right. Um, and I also think there's an important piece there. That's another parallel, which is in a family meeting, one of our jobs is to help families understand what's possible and what's not. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to do that with our mentees too as well. Because they, you know, this field is so complicated. Yeah. Nobody can come in with a into it new with a good sense of what's possible and what's realistic. And I think we need to find a way to do that that aligns with what our mentees are interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, uh, we did a podcast a little while ago. We talked about um, some mentoring points. And one of my favorite questions is all my mentees know is, um, well, this is kind of interesting, but what's the problem? Like, what is the right. problem that you're trying to address? Um, is there like a favorite question uh, that you put to your mentees or um, a phrase that you're known for or like a stylistic approach? Well, I think one of the things I'm known for is really helping people to think ahead and plan ahead and understand, for example, in research, if you want to write a grant, you need to be working on those aims a year in advance. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm a really big fan of being able to think ahead about where you want to go <clears throat> with the flexibility, adaptability that that can change. Mm -hmm. um, but planning ahead, I think, is so important. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. in this area. I think that's one of the things I'm known for. Yeah. I love how many parallels there are. Here we've got the advanced care planning. Yeah. <laughs> the mentees. Yeah. <laughs> so many parallels between palliative care practice and... and I the- also believe that um, it's very important to help mentees figure out what they want to do, what they're interested in, what drives them, and at the same time, how to capitalize on the opportunities and resources available to them through their mentors. Mm -hmm. I really believe that um, where I think people have been most successful is really being able to say, well, I eventually want to get here, but Mm -hmm. right now, the opportunities that are available to me will take me in this direction. I'll learn the skills uh, and then eventually go where I want to go with it. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I mean, I'm guessing too, in palliative care skills, it's, it's breaking bad news too sometimes. It's. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's right. Um, <clears throat> I think the mentor who's a constant cheerleader and so everything's great, every idea is great, um, can do a disservice to mentees. I think sometimes you do have to say, you know, yeah. that's an interesting idea, but it's just not feasible mm-hmm. given the resources you have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also wonder, as as you're living with this disease, it, um, has it changed at all your thoughts about the mentoring process? I mean, because it all sounds, I mean, it, it sounds like it shouldn't. Like, these are all great things. Um, but I'd just love to hear that. Well, I think the biggest thing is it's really shortened the timeline for when people have to be independent from me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the other things I've noted over my career is that there are some really good mentors who can help their trainees as long as their interests are aligned. But as soon as they diverge, they're no longer helpful mentors. Hmm. Um, And the really exceptional mentors, in my opinion, and my mentor was like this, are able to continue to help and support their trainees even when their interests do diverge. And so, you know, for me now, I need to be thinking, okay, how do I set each mentee up for when I'm no longer here? Mm -hmm. What do they need to really be able to succeed? Sometimes that's identifying another mentor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not. Sometimes it's saying, you know what, we all need mentors for our whole lives, but you're a place right now where you can begin to look for mentors for different things, but not feel like you have one person who's mentoring you in your primary interest. Yeah. Um, and Randy, um, because we're talking a lot about kind of what's, what's, what's ahead, ahead for you as a mentor. Um, is it okay if I ask like, when you think about the future um, and living with this disease and being a, you know, academician, what do you see the future has in store for you? Well, I, I mean, I don't know. I know what the median survival is for Boba Anza LS. Um, <clears throat> is that, can I ask, is that a helpful number? Is it like we talk a lot about prognostication mm-hmm. in palliative care? I uh, think it is. I think it's a helpful number for me. Um, but I will also say the other thing that's helpful for me is that I understand distributions, yeah. right? I mean, the median survival, maybe two to four years, but I understand that distribution has a tail and you know, and I don't know where I'll be, but it really does help me, you know, in words 
borrowed from Tony Bach and others, it helps me hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And I need to have a plan that has me exiting in the next one to two years. I hope that's not the case, but I need to have that. I need to think through how I want to live my life now, if that is the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think back to, you know, reading about other people who are dealing with serious illness and who continue to work. Oh, Alex, now I'm blanking. Um, the the neurosurgeon again, we had his, uh, we did a book review. Um, he was at um, Stan. When Breath Becomes Air. When Breath Becomes Air. What was his name? Paul Kalanithi. Paul Kalanithi. Like he was somebody who continued to work, continued to work, having, a, a, you know, a, a, you know mm -hmm. a serious illness diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think for a lot of people, when we think not having this diagnosis, like thinking about, oh, like I wouldn't keep on working. I'd stop working. Um, I'd focus on all these other aspects of my life. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you think about that? There's a lot of yeah. academics about uh, work-life balance and yeah. finding that right balance. How are you thinking about balance, especially having this diagnosis? Yeah, I... So... I'm changing the way I work a lot. I'm spending more time with my family. I'm, I'm focusing on other things right now. Yeah. <clears throat> but I do want to <clears throat> continue working. I love, I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I've decided to give up clinical work. Um, I think my speech makes it hard to run rounds in the ICU or run a family conference. Um, I've, I've always been proud of the kind of doctor I am. I think I'm a good doctor, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's not my, it's, you know, with the time that I've left, it's not where I want to focus. I really want to focus on the mentoring, building this program and center, um, so it can really take off mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. So I have changed what I do, where I work. I worked less than I used to. But I'm also focusing on my family. I, I just got back Saturday from a two-week trip in Paris mm -hmm. with my wife and my daughter and my daughter's best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a wonderful two weeks. And it was really important to me that I be able to do that while I can eat and drink and enjoy the Paris I've fallen in love with. Yeah, very important part of Paris is the eating and drinking. Yes, yeah, indeed. Um, and I know you have colleagues in Paris. You've done sabbaticals there. You've published right. them uh, in the Nijim. Um, uh, uh, what is it like? Um, you, you've been somebody who's worked well in teams. Um, and I wonder if there's a, you know, thoughts for there for our listeners about uh, success in academics and working in teams, particularly in the fields of, you know, palliative care, critical care. Yeah, um, I would say one of, I really enjoy working in teams, but one of my credos, one of my primary goals is to work with people I really like and even love. Um, and I have been very selective over the years about who I choose to work with. I've been selective about the kinds of jobs I've taken because there are, there are jobs where you don't get to choose who you work with. Um, but when you run a center, you do. Um, so it's really driven me to build teams, to be part of teams with people I really enjoy working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like another great piece of advice for for all of the junior, mm -hmm. middle or senior faculty that, that listen to this podcast is making sure that we work with teams that we work well with and that we like. Um, and that oftentimes we have more control than we think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. 
We, we talked a little bit before and you uh, mentioned at the beginning that you're doing more work thinking about your legacy. I wonder if you could say a few words about what you're um, uh, hoping you'll be remembered for, what your legacy is, and um, a- as you're reflecting on, on that, that issue. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll get into talking about our favorite like Randy Curtis studies, which I'm excited to talk about because I have, I have so many. It was hard to pick two. <laughs> Thank you. I, I really do feel like my my biggest legacy is the people I've mentored and what they accomplish. Um, you know, individual papers. I love many of my papers. I. I should probably love them all, but the people have been more important to me mm-hmm. um, that I've mentored and what they can then go on to accomplish. That's all. I've always felt like that's what's most important. Oh, yeah, Alex, you're excited. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> Let's jump into it. I, I, I want to hear, hear your list. <laughs> like when you think about uh, your favorite Randy Curtis articles. <laughs> Well, there are so many I could choose from, but um, here are my two favorite that I use the most often in teaching. Um, uh, and the first one is, um, you know, this was a question on the palliative care boards for our listeners who are palliative care trainees. Um, this is a publication called titled Family Satisfaction with Family Conferences about End of Life Care in the Intensive Care Unit. Increased proportion of family speech is associated with increased satisfaction. I love the way that the title, like it just (laughs) teaches the message right in the title. Increased proportion of family speech is associated with increased satisfaction. Um, You are a senior author on this, speaking of mentoring. Um, This came out in Critical Care Medicine in 2004. And um, this is like standard um, part of palliative care canon now. Um, And it's one of the first things that I teach trainees um, when we're talking about uh, a structured approach to family meetings. Um, Any reflections from you, Randy, about this particular study? Well, this is one of my favorites as well. And, and, you know, when I present my research, you can tell when you make a point that's really salient that catches on. And this is one that always has. Um, it's so simple and yet so important. I will say, you know, speaking of mentoring, this paper was the first author who wrote the paper, the first draft, was Jonathan McDonough. Jonathan was one of my mentees. <laughs> and this paper, this analysis was his idea. Mm. Um, and he was with me as a resident. Uh, and he's the one that went through painstakingly measuring time for each you know, type of speaker. Um, he, he went on to do cardiology and practices now in Alaska. And I just love that. This paper, that's one of my favorites and your favorites, mm-hmm. was really done by a mentee. Mm-hmm. Randy, why why do you think it's the case? Why is it just per, that that time that they're talking results in improved satisfaction? It's all about listening. You know, the same thing we were talking about before with mentoring. It's about the willingness and ability to really listen to patients, families, mentees, understand what the issues are for them, what's most important to them. I think that is simply the most important palliative care skill there is. And that that actually reminds me, I'm going to go to an article that I think you were like a, a deep middle author on, but it was like based on the value mnemonic. And mm-hmm. uh, it was a New England Journal article going to Paris, right? Um, so mm-hmm. out of France about a communication strategy and brochure for relatives of patients dying in the ICU using basically the value mnemonic, which was to value and appreciate what family members said, to acknowledge the family members' emotions, to listen. I love it. Like, listen was one of the 
important yep. parts of that mnemonic to ask questions that would allow the caregiver to understand who the patient was as a person and to elicit questions from family members. Like five simple things. And I love presenting this one because like these five simple things ended up in a New England Journal paper. <laughs> and it found out like the people who got this intervention and this brochure around bereavement, um, uh, they had, you know, um, improved outcomes as far as uh, bereavement outcomes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. And, um, you know, this was a paper that really forged my collaboration with L.A. Azoy and Nancy Kentish Barnes in Paris and it has been such an important part of my career. Um, and when we sent the paper to the journal, the biggest problem the editors had with this paper was how do we explain how profound an effect this simple intervention had? Uh -huh. And we went back and forth with them for uh, six or eight times, and that was really their primary issue. Uh -huh. yeah. um, Alex. Can we're gonna do more lightning round? Other favorite <laughs> papers. All right. Okay. This is this. I love talking about this one. This one is makes for great presentations. By the way, to our listeners, this is alterations during medical interpretation of ICU family conferences that interfere with or enhance communication. Published in Chess, two thousand and eight. Randy Curtis, senior author, first author, uh, last name Pham. Yep. Correct. Came on Pham. Imam Pham. And this one is the um is is just um so great if you're doing a teaching about the importance um of uh using professional uh interpreters um and yet also cautioning that even with a professional interpreter you need to check for understanding. And I love the way in this article that you included the text themselves. So just to set it up for our listeners. In this study, you recorded interpreted family meetings that were not conducted in English, where a professional interpreter um, was present and did the translation. Then you took those recordings and a separate research interpreter reverse translated them back into English. And so now you have the original English and you have the comparison of uh, what was translated. And you can compare the two. And it was, it just, you know, it makes the case that you included the actual text itself within the article. So, for example, um, like over about half the time there was an alteration mm -hmm. in the speech, and like 90% of the time it had negative impact on communication. And sometimes it was really obvious. For example, doctor says, I don't know, um, this is a very rapidly progressing cancer. And the interpreter translating says, he doesn't know because it starts gradually. And in this case, it's like just diametrically opposite. Very yeah. rapidly progressing cancer becomes he doesn't know because it starts gradually. And people get that like, okay, that's a big problem. But what, what I think really sticks with people more are the subtle examples. And here's one. Doctor says, the problem with this option is that he may have to stay on this machine for the rest of his life. And the interpreter translating says... But the problem with this option is that he will have to stay on this machine for the rest of his life. So I don't know if our listeners caught that, but the may became a will. He may have to stay on this machine for the rest of his life became he will have to stay on this machine for the rest of his life. One word, very subtle, and yet has profound implications for the family's understanding of prognosis and what lies ahead for this patient. Um, so this just hammers home to me the importance of uh, checking for understanding. And when I teach this, people just get it. They get it. Um, yeah. Any reflections from you, and uh, Randy, about this? Yeah, no, I, I love this paper too. Another one that was driven by a mentee. Um, and I think you're absolutely right, Alex, that <clears throat> the take-home message is check for understanding. But the other important message, I think, is to understand how to work with interpreters. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us, certainly me, before I we did this work, would just go into family conference, there's the interpreter, start talking, and I thought I was being a good 
Dr. Wigman and Jupiter if I spoke fl- slowly and stopped once in a while. Mm-hmm. But not understanding the situation that they're in in these difficult family conferences. And we have since learned to include the interpreter in our pre-conference huddle with mm-hmm. the team and our post-conference debrief to really view the interpreter as an integral part of the team that's communicating with this family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this was part of a sequence of studies, I should say. Mm-hmm. We'll try to put um, them in the show notes for, associated with this podcast. There was another one where you talked with interpreters about yeah. like to be in these serious conversations. And they say, so often the meeting ends and I just am dismissed. Right. There's no follow-up. There's no debriefing. And part of our role is to help the professional teams, including the interpreters, uh, uh, w- uh, process and work through these really challenging life or death discussions, high, high emotional content. Yeah. Um, so that really hammered that point home to me as well. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to switch gears. I also got to say, I loved all the papers you did. Like you and Doug White together, it's like, you know, 80s Lakers teams. Or <laughs> like, it's just, like I loved everything that you guys did. There was a great chess paper in 2008 practical guidance for evidence-based ICU family meetings. That's that one's still I go to. Like it's such great, you know, there is a great picture of like going for paternalism, uh, uh, where doctor decides to autonomy. And I still use that in my teaching. Absolutely love that. And there was another one I think you did with Doug on empathy in ICU family meetings, mm-hmm. where like a third of family meetings, there were no empathic responses when when it was recorded and listened to. And Empathy, empathic responses when used were actually associated with improved satisfaction of family members. Yeah. Um, another one that I love like going to. So I yeah. love that combination. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's one of my favorite teaching points as well. One of my favorite papers. Um, Doug White was a, a distance mentee of mine. He was at UCSF, I was at UW. And boy, it just brings home the point about how important mentoring is and how important it is to be a two-way street. I mean, I've learned as much from Doug as he ever learned from me um, and forged a, a relationship and a partnership that has lasted, you know, my whole career. Well, uh, my last question, too, um, is uh, you... Can you tell me a little bit about the the Cambia um, Foundation? Um, uh, heard a lot about it, um, uh, but I don't have a great idea exactly what it is. And like Cambia right. Scholars, would you mind yeah, taking Cambia a second? Scholars, yeah. How are these things related? Are they related? Yeah, what? yeah absolutely. So the Cambia Health Foundation is a, a private foundation uh, based in Portland, Oregon. <clears throat> that is the foundation of the Cambia Health Solutions, which is a, a company that actually owns multiple companies, but includes a number of insurers and others. And the Cambia Health Foundation funds in several areas, but they have gotten very passionate about palliative care um, and have really devoted most of their funding to palliative care. And they've done that through individual grants, but they've also launched the Sojourn Scholars Leadership Program, which is really designed to build the pelvic care leadership of, of the future. And this program has been going on for almost a decade and has actually already built the pelvic care leadership of today and, and the future. The foundation gave us a grant, which is why my center is named after that, but it also devotes a lot of its attention and funding to the Sojourn Scholars Leadership Program, which is a wonderful program for future building future leaders in palliative care. Mm-hmm. Which of our listeners should apply for that program? Like 
Yeah, so that program is very intentionally meant to be to cover all the disciplines in health care. So physicians, nurses, um, uh, social workers, spiritual care, hospital administrators, really a very um, uh, interdisciplinary program. It's also meant to cover all kinds of leadership. So it can be research, clinical leadership, education. It really spans the um, spectrum around building leadership. Well, Randy, I want to be mindful of time. I want to thank you. But before we leave, Alex, a little bit more. It's a good life. A little bit more here. To my friends in New York, I say hello. My friends in LA, well, they don't know what I've been through the last few years or so. Paris to China to Colorado. Sometimes there's airplanes I can't jump out. Sometimes it's bullshit that don't work out. We got our stories, but please tell me what there is to complain about. When you're happy like a fool, I let it take you over. Then everything is out. You're gonna take it in. This has got to be a good life This has got to be a good life This could really be a good life <laughs> Oh, say oh This feeling that you can't find Like the city is on fire tonight This could really be a good life A good, good life And uh, Randy... A very, very big thank you for joining us on this podcast. Um, just want to let you know that you have touched so many of us, people that you don't even know, or um, like myself included. Like we, I, we've been on a podcast together, but uh, there are so many connections, like secondary connections that I have with you, that, and it just shows the importance that you have played in building this field and the expertise. And I got to say, building uh, the future leaders of palliative care. Um, so thank you for everything that you have done and for spending the time with us on today's podcast. Yeah, and for talking uh, on this podcast about you know serious illness and living yeah. with serious illness, which is a highly emotional subject. And really appreciate you sharing that with our listeners. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on and the opportunity to have this time with you reminds me that it's been a really good life. Um, Randy, thank you again. All of our listeners, thank you. I think this serves as a reminder, like we have to live every day and it's a good life. Thank you, Archstone Foundation, for your continued support. And everybody, have a very good day. Goodbye.